Well, good afternoon and welcome to Christian Concerns Roundtable with Christian Concern. Um, we've been doing these live streams on Fridays uh, for uh, throughout the lockdown and um, it's great to connect with you. We're calling it Roundtable or Round the Table with Christian Concern because it's your chance to get round the table with us and ask your questions and comments and discuss with us in the comments, whether you're on YouTube, whether you're on Facebook, you can put your comments in there, we'll see them and we'll respond to questions um, as they come. And it's also around the table because we like to bring on some special guests. We've got a very interesting special guest today who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, but first of all, we've got some of the superstars of Chris Concern. Uh, Karis Mosley is here with us, um, I think connected in there. Um, experts on all things, uh, one, of our, one of our top researchers. And also Andrea Williams um, is here as well. And um, we're all here in the UK, but our special guest is coming from right over the other side of the world, James Parker. Um, he's British made and bred, um, but he now lives in Australia. Welcome to you, James. Thank you very much, Tim. Great to be with it, you. It's great to have you here. And I noticed that your thing says it's true identity. Can you explain this, what, what your true identity is or what is true identity? Well, I, I mean, my true identity is very much as the son of the living God. I can assure you about that. But Fantastic. true identity is it's been the creation of a new national, rather informal network and setup that reaches out to people very practically and hands on to deal with gender, to deal with sexuality and to help people deal with identity. Clearly, identity politics is the big thing here today. And uh, it's where most of our young people and many middle aged people are also confused. So that's a little bit about what true identity is about. It reaches out into the areas of, of pornography addiction, into child sexual abuse, into the whole LGB agenda, as well as the T as in transgenderism, uh, area of transgenderism. But it also looks about what it means to uphold the dignity of what is male and what is female. Fantastic. Well, that sounds great. And I'm sure we can put some links up to your Facebook page and your YouTube page um, in the comments there as well. Um, so, James, you've got a, a really interesting story, haven't you, that relates to this um, topic. That's probably why you set up this ministry. Um, and um, your story was published. You published a story just uh, last week or towards the end of last week um, about your story. Can you tell us a bit about it? You, you, you grew up here in England, didn't you? Um, I, I did. I did. I spent my first 45 years in England. I've just been over here in Australia for seven years. That makes me the, um, uh, the ripe old age of 52. Um, uh, but really, I think what was significant about my own life, and certainly, I mean, we all have aspirations and dreams as young people. And the, the, the greatest area, in a sense, of struggle in my own heart as a young man was the fact that I believed that I was gay. And I came out at the age of 17. And right. I was the first guy to come out in my um, Christian high school in the north of England um, right. and I travelled to London and I was the first guy to come out in my university college in London as well. Now we're talking back in the 80s when the wow. whole issue of gay was, you know, was still very much undercover and so I saw it as my duty and as my obligation really to fight for active gay rights so I set up a lesbian and gay group at university, I was right. very much involved with Which gay university rights. was that? Sorry? Which university was that? I, I, was, I was actually based in, in Roehampton, so there were I was there to right. learn to teach. So I was um I was at one of the the um, colleges there, uh, which right. was then the University of Roehampton. Uh, sorry, now it's the University of Roehampton. Yeah. So I would say the first guy to come out in my own college there, and um yeah was involved in gay pride, very much in got involved as well in the lesbian and gay Christian movement. I'd been raised right. in the Christian home, and God was still important to me. Um, right. But I, I, I saw, I just believed that I'd been created gay, that God had made me gay, it's all I'd ever known. So yeah. that's why I threw myself into the, the lifestyle in that way. Um, uh, there was a time of being incredibly promiscuous, welcome to the gay community, but, mm -hmm. uh, but I did desire to settle down in a long-term relationship. And I did meet my, I've got to be honest, this guy ticked all my boxes, he was my ideal man. And I entered into this long-term gay relationship. Right. Now, what was interesting... This is what, in your 20s? This is in your 20s? I was in my 20s at the time. Right. That's right. So there I was in my 20s in this long-term gay relationship. And it was in the midst of that relationship that um, a, um, a guy at, at university came to me and he said to me, um, he said, do you want more love in your life? And let's be honest, which of us doesn't want more love? So I yeah. said, of course I do. 
Uh, so he invited me along to a gathering of young people where there was worship and the word of God was broken open. But the most important thing of all, there was an opportunity for me to say yes to the person of Jesus Christ. And look, because I wanted more love, I said, I said, Lord, if there's anything that stands in the way of your love, I, I, I'm sorry. I made a prayer of repentance. Really. You already considered yourself a Christian, though, did you, at that point? I, I would very much have considered myself a Christian, but very much a gay Christian. And those two words are very much, you know, glued together. Yeah. Um, so I saw I saw the fact that, well, God had made me gay. Therefore, I'm a gay Christian. Right. So but but I nevertheless, I, I'm I made the sinner's prayer and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. And I prayed that God would send me his Holy Spirit and that he would reorder in me anything that was chaotic. Right. Now, I had no idea really what that meant. I just I just knew that's what the Holy Spirit did. He brought order out of chaos. Right. And um, my life didn't feel particularly chaotic. Um, but then what happened is the more that I began to pray and the more that I began to develop uh, an intimate relationship with Jesus. First of all, the first thing that happened is my boyfriend noticed the difference. And he said, can I have some of what you've got? Wow. Um, and right. I said, well, yeah, you know, it's free. God's love's free. Um <laughs> And, and, and nobody within the midst of this this youth gathering was pointing uh, at my sexuality or at my right. relationship. They were pointing right. me towards Christ. Mm -hmm. And they too were being humble and vulnerable with me um, and talking about their own struggles and difficulties and their own need to repent. So I just, in some way, I felt like one of the other people. Anyway, my, my boyfriend, he, he got deeply touched by the Holy Spirit. And then we became really this model gay Christian couple. Right. Um, and so, again, I felt I'd got just another, uh, another um, um, bow, you know, in, in my, or another quiver in my, in, in there for my bow. And, and it was, it was something, it was, as I say, life just seemed perfect. But the more that I prayed, then what happens is the cracks began to show. Mm -hmm. And what happened is, is, um, and I'd be honest with you, I don't know whether I went to therapy first. If I began to talk with the therapist first of all, I did. I did do that, but um, my 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 therapy really started seriously after I'd finished the relationship. But I did have a few sessions beforehand before I finished the relationship, and I came to the understanding that very clearly. So why did Why did you finish the relationship then? Because I began to realise that my boyfriend was looking for something in me that I was looking for in him, and and I, I couldn't have put it into these words at the time. But it's only in hindsight that I can say that he was trying to find the mystery of manhood in me and right. I was trying to find the mystery of manhood in him. But right. neither of us had it. Right. Neither of us had it. And what happened is the light of the world had begun to shine into our lives. And there, and I'd, I'd taken this journey before him. I was, uh, in a sense, I was being discipled to pray a lot more beforehand as well. And, <laughs> and I, I began to come to the realization, this perfect model long-term committed gay relationship and we'd been talking about going to the netherlands at that time to have a blessing it was the only place at that time that was giving blessings to people i mean we were that seriously committed to one another we'd been totally monogamous which is pretty rare in the gay community so i'll be honest with you i felt i had the best of everything and then god began to show me that actually i didn't have the best of everything there was still more behind that that i that, that, you know, that, that i needed to have Mm, okay um and then so so then you you started to talk about therapy so tell us about that what is that what what, what did that mean well and then, then what happened is i just decided to go ahead and go into what i regard as regular therapy so i went into did some cognitive therapy i did some behavioral therapy um i did something called emdr which looks at de dealing with uh, sort of to, like, trying to why did you why did you approach these therapists what were you looking for out of that well i tell you what happened is i began to i came across really what i regard as emotional hurdles you know i began as i finished this relationship um i began to feel this just deep unease within my own self and um and a mate of mine just said to me he said well have you thought about therapy and i talked to a therapist who was very very gracious um, and I thought, OK, I, I'll I think I'll give this a go. I, that there was that feeling of just sort of in a in a in a turmoil deep within me is all I can say. It, right. it wasn't it wasn't mountainous, but it was very much real. And right. so what happens is that I made the decision that I would go ahead and um, uh, that that I would go to this therapist. And so that's what I ended up doing. Is it specifically it Christian great. therapy or not? Not specifically Christian therapy. And what happened is I actually went to a Christian therapist 
And right. alongside that, I also was having spiritual direction. Right. And that was very, very important. So it wasn't just a secular um, uh, therapist that I was seeing. It was a yeah. Christian therapist who understood my commitment to the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, and also what happened is, um, you know, I was able to have spiritual direction alongside that as well. So I was being very, very carefully discipled along this journey. Um, yeah. And that made all the difference to me because what happens, it, it means that um, this wasn't just looking yeah. at what's happening in my own mind. It wasn't just looking at what's happening in my own behaviors and my beliefs, but it was okay. looking also at the very, so it was see, see, uh, searching of my soul. Okay. Okay. So I've happened? got a question here from someone on Facebook. Um, sure. I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Sorry if not. Kike Brown, how did you perceive scripture relating to homosexuality when you were still in the lifestyle? Uh, well, what happens is, is um, in, in true fashion for anybody who regards themselves as a gay Christian, they either interpret it as they want to interpret it, saying, oh, Sodom and Gomorrah's sin was the fact they weren't hospitable or, you know, um, uh, homosexuals or anything to do with, with sodomy refers to people who sleep around. Well, I wasn't sleeping around. I was in a committed gay relationship. Right. Yeah. I've got a bad commitment, so therefore it must be fine. Um so that was the take, Tim, that, that I had yeah. at, at that stage. Okay. And um, uh, so that, that's or, or really what happens, or you just ignore it. You just ignore the verses that you don't want to read because they're too okay. uncomfortable. OK, all right. So so then tell us about the therapy and where that led you then. Well, what the therapy did is it be, literally it began to give me the opportunity to see things in a different light and to think differently and to act differently. And my therapist began to just challenge me about some of the preconceptions that I had about myself. I yeah. said, you know, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm very feminine, aren't I? And she'd say, well, what makes you think that? Right, right. The opportunity for me to explore these different things. And, right. um, uh, you know, I, I regarded myself as lesser than other men. At the right. time, my voice was a lot higher. Uh, my yeah. walk was very, very camp. Um, and, uh, you know, I could relate mo more to women than I ever could to men. And what happens is there was an opportunity for me not just to remain subjectively where I was, but the therapist began to help me to look outside of all the way in which I'd grown up. And as I say, the different um, belief systems I had about myself and what the prayer did in the midst of this. And this is very important is the prayer began to loosen the opportunity for memories from the past to be able to come up. And right. what was critical for me in the midst of this is that in the midst of my therapy, alongside the prayer, is the realization of extensive childhood sexual abuse came to the surface. Now that took time. So you forgot forgotten this or suppressed this? Had you suppressed this memory? Had you all forgotten it? Totally. Totally suppressed right. the memory. Right. Totally. And even when it came up, I didn't want to believe it was true. Right. And I'll be honest with you, even though I walked with that memory for a number of years and the the it was uh, I, the the key abuse, because I had several abusers overall, but the key abuse was by a teacher from my primary school. And that case actually ended up in um, the Crown Court in the UK. And we ended up with a conviction of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, well, a, a convicted paedophile. He was found guilty. Wow. Now, wow. if that memory had never come up, I would never have been the key witness in such an important case wow. um, for a man who was, who was found to be a, a prolific paedophile. So therapy was, it played, um, it wouldn't, didn't just help me, but right. it helped to protect other children. Right. And it yeah. also got this man who was struggling, this, this man with these paedophilic tendencies, we managed to get him the necessary treatment and help that he needed so that he couldn't go on again and commit more crime. Right. Yeah, that's very impressive. Very impressive. So, um, so listen, I've got a question here. Pete Chris Hodge on Facebook. Does same-sex attraction go after conversion? Does same-sex attraction go after conversion? I, I think the question is, does conversion sort it out, sort it all out immediately? Um, no, not at all. Not at all. In fact, I mean, I, I, have, I have many friends. And as I say, I, I, I run different networks here in, in Australia, as I have done in the UK. And there are many men, many friends, men and women I know, who remain same-sex attracted, and they do yep. all their lives. But see, well, the you considered yourself a gay Christian as well, didn't you? You considered yourself a I gay did, Christian for, 
for quite a long time. But what they've done, like me, is the first thing they've done is they they've rejected the world's labels. Yeah. And they've realized that they are human beings like everybody else. They're human yeah. beings with different trials, with different sufferings, with different yeah. challenges. Yeah. And, and what's happened is for many of these people, even if they are as same sex attracted or as gender questioning today as they've always been, for many of them, they said that certainly their conversion to Christ means that the goal for them now is not marriage. It's not heterosexuality. It's holiness. And it's yeah. obedience to the person of Jesus Christ. And all yeah. I can say to you is this is whether they're same sex attracted or not, their happiness, their, their level of richness of life is significantly yeah. higher, significantly. Their anxiety lowers, their depression lowers, the ability to be able to actually take some form of control around their addictive behavior, yeah. less than that. Yeah. They, these yeah. are all fruit. That I'm going to ask Karis then, if, are, there stubby, are there studies showing this, Karis? Do we have evidence of this kind of thing that, that um, James talked about that, that we can cite that says that people who decide to live a holy lifestyle are happier and, and generally more emotionally stable, should we say? I think there is a general view that um, people's well-being can improve um, even if the attraction doesn't necessarily change. And I think that's very important. I mean, well-being can sound like a vague category, but um, if people live more in accordance with how they're created, uh, whether they're married or single, that's got to be good. And I think I'm really interested to ask James, what do you think about in the journey that people with same-sex attraction have when they come to faith, um, where should the topic of creation come in? Because you were talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, which is a very negative thing, and it's one episode in the Bible, but creation, I think, is is important. How, how would well, you... Well, I mean, you know, it, let's be honest, the transgenderism and, say, identity politics is a big, massive topic today, and yet we go back to the first three chapters of Genesis, and it says male and female, he created them. And um, I deal with, and I've dealt with, uh, a number of people who have uh, transitioned to mimic the opposite sex. And I don't say that uh, in, in a judgmental way, but it's mimicry. There's over yeah. 6,000 chromosomal differences between men and women. And mm. it doesn't matter how much somebody seeks to or tries to be the opposite sex, it, they, they fail. Deep, deep down, they fail. And that's why it's so important that there are places that offer serious pastoral care that's yeah. able to meet people where they are. We're not about judgment. We really are about supporting people in their own search for the truth yeah. itself and to be able yeah. to love them in the midst of that. I thought I was a woman trapped in a man's body. I'm just really pleased. Oh, did you? Really? Right, I, right, okay. I, I, I mean, so you know, so this, I, is beyond, this is beyond being gay. You're actually thinking you're a woman trapped in a woman's man's body as well. Well, in those days, I mean, how many people regarded themselves as transgender back in the 1980s, 1990s? nobody yeah <laughs> we didn't talk about those things um yeah. and i just thought well that's my lot you know i did look into the fact that whether there was a possibility of sex change and there was very little going on in those days unlike right. today the tragedy that's happening across the board particularly to our young people today right. um but 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 i but i i was literally i was stuck in the world of the feminine um right and that's why in, in i mean today i love being a, a bloke i i love being in my body um, even though it's been profoundly abused in the past. And that's the restorative work that's been able to take place for me. This is so, so tell me about, I just want to get to sort of the, the next important bit of the story, because you're, you, you ended up finding your sex attraction did change, did you? Is that right? I did indeed. What happened is this, is I, and, and I talked earlier on about the therapy and about the beliefs and the behaviours. So there was cognitive therapy, there was behavioural therapy. But, you know, beneath our behaviours, or behind our behaviors, there's beliefs, but behind our beliefs, there's often a vow. And what the spiritual aspect did for me in line with the therapy is it showed me that deep, deep down in my heart, I had made different vows during my childhood. Right. And let me share this with you, Tim, is, is in going into the therapy, it, the therapeutic world and the spiritual world were like a double scaffold around the essence of my entire life. And that double scaffold working with Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, now there's a cross time, yeah. means what, what happened is other repressed memories came up, and I began to realize there was profound pain relating back, right, not just around my birth, but even into the womb itself. 
Now, I'd been abandoned at birth. I'd been born right. two, two months premature with a twin sister. Right. I was abandoned right. at birth, incubated for three months, fostered for three months, then put in an orphanage before being adopted. Now, I had this revelation. I can't almost explain how I got it, but it was just there through the silence and in my own prayer and with a good therapist who trusted the process we were going through that I had made a vow, even in my mother's womb, not to trust men because my mother had been abandoned by her lover who'd impregnated her. Her father died and she had been previously married and this man had abandoned her as well. So three critical men abandoned her and in my the very essence of my being in the womb, if you like, mm -hmm. I made this vow not to trust men. Well, that vow affected my belief system and that belief system affected my behaviours. So even as a small infant, I didn't trust men. And I wouldn't trust men. But this is what's most interesting is when I came to this sudden realization in my prayer and in my therapy, I literally repented of the vow that I made as a, as a child. Now, this is all in faith. And I said, I repent of any and every way in which I made a choice not to trust men. Yeah. Lord, I repent. And I asked that you'd restore to me the years the locusts have eaten, as it says in Joel 2.25. Right. Within months, I'm in my late 20s now my voice begins to drop right my walk right. begins to change my right. head goes my shoulders go back and i'm starting now to basically there's a massive decrease suddenly overnight in my erotic attraction towards other men and right. i'm beginning to feel like i'm taking my place as a man among other men because right. i believe for me at least that was my root cause now right. in many people i deal with we go in search very gently but of what the root cause is that enables yeah. somebody or permits somebody to get trapped in a place where the same sex attracted man says, I no longer feel like I'm like other men. I've got trapped. And we look for what that is. Sometimes we have to undo lots and lots of layers to get to that place. But it's a yeah. very fun, adventurous journey. And even slight um, resolution around different issues of the past decreases people's anxiety, decreases their depression. It brings about a greater sense of happiness, as Karis has just said as well. So I moved to a place where I went from um, being wholly same-sex attracted to hardly any same-sex attraction to feeling totally asexual for a time, which is almost like going back to sort of late childhood. And it was yeah. then <laughs> that the unexpected happened. And I began to see the beauty and the radiance of woman in a way I'd never seen it. And man, it was scary, but it was also very exciting. And that led me on to end up dating women and to eventually become married. And then I ended up uh, becoming a dad. And everything I was told would, could never happen and would never happen was a gift that was suddenly presented to my life. Yeah. And basically, I came to understanding that I had been lied to for years and years and years. I'd only been affirmed in my brokenness and in my wounding. Nobody turned around and deeply affirmed my biology and affirmed me for the man that God had created me to be in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 fantastic. So, so um, listen, we've got a comment here from Sebastian Langley on YouTube. I wonder what you'd respond to him. Um, he says, uh, people who are same-sex attracted, brackets exclusively, do not get the opportunity to live in marriage. They can. This can be very hard for us to accept because the path of celibacy is the only option, but it is hard. What would you say to Sebastian? Well, I would say I'd say this to him. I'd say that every life calling is hard. Every life calling right. is hard. The, 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 the right. challenge we have today is, you know, let's be honest. If 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 uh, Sebastian wants to reflect carefully along with me uh, on what's happened in the last 50, 60 years, is our, our our pop music or our music says, unless you with somebody and you're loving someone, basically your life is empty. Well, that is a lie. It's an absolute not a lie. There are many, yeah. many single people out there who are doing the most dynamic things. And ultimately, sometimes marriage can partly get in the way of what it is to really serve the Lord. But not just this. Ultimately, every one of us is called to marriage. Every one of mm. us has the, um, a, a wedding invitation engraved onto our soul to be united with Christ, who is our groom. So if people, if all of us took that really seriously, and this is, again, what I do with a lot of the guys who are single and may always be single, and the women who are single and may always be single, I say, you have the opportunity for relationships and friendships and to serve God in such a way yeah. that others just don't have. They're too busy doing laundry and changing nappies and doing the school run and all these other things and trying to put bacon on the table for several people. 
I said, mm. you have the opportunity here to do something mm. that is absolutely terrific and amazing. And mm. often when we look at the lives of incredibly saintly people of the past since Christ, the majority of them were single. They were single people who said, Lord, I'm going to be True. committed to you. True. And that was very much my own life for 28 years before. I mean, a love for the Lord Jesus Christ to be wedded to him. You know, a holy people is a happy people. I mean, when we really love him, then our fulfillment is in him. And it's Absolutely. the lie of the world that says that the only fulfillment that you can really get is in some kind of sexual relationship. We lie to our young people. We do. When we, um, when we talk to them about um, safe sex is when you're ready. When we think about the kind of stuff that we're serving our children at the moment, when we think about what we let our children into, when we think about how even our youth clubs at church um, are raging with stuff, and when we think about the pornography that's rife in our society, what a countercultural yeah. message we have from the pop culture, um, from even what our schools are teaching around relationships and sex education. Just imagine if in our schools we were talking about purity and holiness and godliness and that this is the pursuit of happiness this is the pursuit of joy this is where you will find your true identity and i think that in james's story um, that is so powerful we've seen that when the world affirmed in him those things that confused him um he was not the person that he was meant to be uh, but we have seen God's faithfulness because he cried out to God in prayer <laughs> and he went to there and we saw his faithfulness and we see this incredible testimony that we've yeah, heard yeah. this So afternoon. what I want to get to though um, next, James, is the political situation over there in Australia because you've um, well, you've almost come out now as an ex-gay, haven't you, I suppose, and with your story about being helped with therapy. Um, but they've just passed some laws over there in Australia. Tell us about that. Well, what's happened is we have um, uh, we've got eight states and territories over here. We have two territories, Northern Territory, the Australian Capital Territory and six states. And what's yeah. happened is one of our territories, which is uh, Cam which, uh, contains Canberra, the Australian Capital Territory and uh, the state of Queensland have both in the past couple of weeks passed legislation to ban any form of therapy that begins to uh, uh, address anything around unwanted same-sex attraction or around anybody questioning their gender so yeah. basically what the politicians have voted for is that people can only be affirmed in an lgb or a tqqiap plus 2s whatever letters you want to use today that they've got to be only affirmed in that identity which is the which is where the mistake yeah. happened in my life at the age of 14 i was affirmed wrongly as a gay man um, right. And what they're doing is they're not just doing that, that they're turning around and saying that in Queensland, you can have up to $18,000. That's about £10,000 fine for that. Um, and in the, the fine is for what? Helping somebody who wants to be helped to affirm, um, yeah. you know, moving away yeah. from same sex density. Is that, is that what it is? That's right. So in other words, if I turned up at, at a church tomorrow or a therapist's off, therapist's office or even a GP, and so, yeah. look, I've got unwanted same-sex attraction. Can you help me? Yeah. And that person in any way sought to help me, right. they put themselves, they leave themselves open to a £10,000 fine in um, uh, in Queensland. And so if they jail. talk to you, if they pray for you, anything like that, not even yeah. paid therapy. It doesn't have to be paid anything. therapy or anything like that. Anything. And look, it's so bad in the Australian Capital Territory where they have a, what's called a chief minister, in a sense of a premier, if you like, a kind of a, a prime minister of the yeah. territory is a, yeah. a guy called Andrew Barr. And uh, last year he got um, what well, people call it married. I call it miraged to his same sex partner. And right. um, I'm allowed to say that I've lived a heterosexual and a homosexual relationship. I know the difference between the two and man, there's a difference anyway. Yeah. Um, but it, so he, he's basically um, pushed through a law there to say that nobody is even permitted to leave the Australian Capital Territory and seek help elsewhere. The same fine and possibility of imprisonment still applies to them. Now, if this is so a the lockdown, person seeking help or the person helping them or both? Both. It's a violation right. of human rights, he said. He said, this is a form of abuse. 
and um, right. basically said, we will not violate pe people's human rights. The very thing he's doing is abusing people and violating their human rights. You see, James, this is reminiscent. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a private member's bill in the Republic of Ireland that had similar clause that you couldn't uh, go and they specify the types of travel. And I think I, I remember looking at it and thinking, but well, you can still have therapy in a helicopter or something like that. But yeah, th this is the beginning of travel bans on, on people like yourself and, and anybody who supports you. Uh, and it's very dangerous. It's not going to go away. And I think we need to be much more aware of, of this possibility. They won't stop. That's right. Let's be clear about this. I just want to be really clear about this. Yeah. Can I just be really clear about this? So they're criminalizing talking to somebody to try and help them um, in a way that doesn't affirm LGBT, in a way that sort of says, I want to move away from LGBT. That So so some conversations are criminalized with a $18,000 fine. Is that right? Yeah. Well, and, wow. and, and I say in ACT, it's a $24,000 fine and a prison sentence. And a prison sentence as well. So, so yes. somebody comes to me in church and says, can you pray for me? I want to try and change my sex attraction. And I pray I could get imprisoned for that. Yes. Wow. Right. Okay. And, and I think and course, what I'm surprised about, what I'm surprised about, that this has come to Australia so fast. We, in a sense, I felt we're ahead of Australia with our um, the memorandum of understanding, which works across the counselling professions, means that in effect today, most counsellors know that they will have difficulty getting registration. Um, if they say that they help people move away from unwanted same-sex attraction in the United Kingdom. This yeah. in effect in the United Kingdom is creating a bar to professional regulated counselling in this area. And it's why we've seen the case of Mike Davidson at Core Issues Trust and, and, and his organisation come under such threat. It's, it's why we've got the inter... Um, IFTCC, the International Federation for Therapeutic Counselling and Choice, formed across the world in order to provide a safe place for those in Australia to come, although we see it's not safe because of the fine and the criminalisation of these things. We have a move in the United Kingdom now to ban um, um, uh, to, 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 to ban uh, so-called, this terrible labelling of so-called uh, gay conversion therapy but in effect, we already have it. What they want to do is to move to further punishment. Uh, that is, we see that it's for real because James is testifying that it's for real. But worse, but, yeah. but even more yeah. than this, James's story is the story of, of radical, spiritual transformation, healing and hope. And yeah. the church to be alive and understand that yeah. this yeah. testimony is what we're not going to have we're not well we will have it because we won't be stopped but so, so the people who helped james would be criminalized presumably now if they did it now yeah, um, it. and that's that's what james is trying to say but ruth margaret stunnel makes a comment here on facebook she says are they going to claim james was never gay uh they would want to ban him sharing his life story i mean how does how does this work for you james there you're out there you're, you're sharing your story, you're telling your story in Australia and, and across the world. So how does it work for you? Do they say you were never day, gay? I mean, you used to say I'm born gay. So I mean, what do they say? You know, it's, it's in my stories out there. Like I say, I, I didn't accidentally have over 200 male sexual partners before, you know, I entered into a long-term gay relationship. Uh, you know, what makes a 14-year-old contact the lesbian and gay switchboard? What makes a 17-year-old come out at school then at university at 18 and fight for gay pride? It's a load of rubbish to say that I was never gay. What happens is that's a little bit like being selective about the scriptures that you want to read. You basically take on the narrative that you want to believe rather than looking 360 degrees, becoming fully informed and having the truth. Now, today, yeah. I walk with many, many people who are literally, they're falling out of the gay LGBT community. Mm. In some cases, mm. they've had their breasts cut off or their genitalia cut off or rearranged horrifically and the rest of it. And now they regret it. Then there's lots yeah. of other people, many, many young people who, because of, of, of the trauma of pornography and who are stuck in their porn addictions, and they've actually been sexually abused by other teens in school previously. And, yeah. and they've got deep, deep traumas, these people. And yeah. 
Probably, I'd say probably about 90% of people I deal with, they knowingly have been sexually abused during their childhood. Uh, and mm. that often explains why they've got such a strong sense of same-sex attraction. Um, yeah. And there, there we have politicians turning around and saying, oh, you know, um, you can't get any help for this. Well, I'm sorry, this makes our politicians pro-pedophilic. Is that what right. the end game is we have to ask ourselves? And people often yeah. say to me, Will there be more? Will there be fewer convictions of paedophiles if the, if this therapy ban, is, you know, yeah. gets put forward and is upheld? I say, of course, of course, right. there'll be fewer convictions. There will yeah. be more. There'll be more paedophile behaviour going on, and that's what yeah. the taxpayer is paying for. We're mad to sit back and do nothing about it. Yeah. What do you say to someone like Tim James on Facebook here, who says there's no transformation because he still has same-sex attraction? So someone who's denying that you've been transformed, what do you say to someone like that? Who's saying that I have, I've not been transformed. Well, yes. the challenge I have is this, you see, is, is all my mates who knew me years and years and years ago, they now say to me, oh, my goodness, man, are you transformed? You right. know, so I have to take their word for that. But, but also, <laughs> the bottom line is this. I, I mean, you've you got to understand this. I had no attraction towards women whatsoever. Right. Whatsoever. Right. You know, um, so for me to spend years dating women, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I like women. <laughs> Get over it. You know, <laughs> it's just the way it is. You know, right. um, um, please ask me how I fathered a child or had several pregnancies, actually, from that. But uh, there we are. It, the, the, the bottom line is this is it, it might be difficult for some people to accept, but I can't I can't deny my reality. And I refuse yeah. to deny my reality. And I don't yeah. ask anybody else to deny their reality. So when somebody yeah. comes to me and says, I am gay and I'm happy in this and I've got all my rights, I say, okay, well, I accept you. But why don't you accept me? Why are you so right. full of bigotry? Why are you so exclusive? Why are you so intolerant? Why are you right. so hate-filled? You know, wh why, why are you so exclusive? I, I'm saying this, this does not work for a cohesive society. And what we're beginning mm. to see now is the mm. macro mm. LGBTQ plus minority mm. are beginning mm. to vilify, bully and dehumanize the micro minority of those people who are leaving behind homosexuality. OK, OK. Listen, I want to get on to the politics a bit more, but there's just a genuine question here. Jim McGill on Facebook says this genuine question. How does sexual abuse lead on to same-sex attraction. Could you explain that? Yes, absolutely, of course. Uh, and look, sexual abuse um, is, is different in, for many different, for, uh, for different people. But let's put it this way. Um, what it did for me is this is, it, uh, arousal is ultimately, I believe in God's design, arousal is meant for your wedding night. That's what it's meant for. And anything before that begins to have an effect on the way in which you see yourself and those around you. So my first sexual experience was at the age of eight by a grown man. So he grooms me into a place where he basically has sex with me. Well, that gives me an ambivalence. First of all, my erogenous zones go, oh, that was quite pleasant. But what they also go is, there's something deeply wrong here. This setting is wrong. So what happens is I'm drawing again and again, and also, of course, my abuser's telling me, be quiet, otherwise it will get worse. But he's luring me into a place where my experience of arousal is man-on-man -man sexual activity. That's what it becomes. Right. And it's all hidden and it's all pushed away. But what it's also doing, it's not just man on man. I'm a child who rather than being affirmed by man, I'm being, um, or rather being given dignity, I'm being um, layered with depravity. He's, mm. he's, he's unaffirming me. He's actually desecrating me. So what happens yeah. is I begin to lose sight of the dignity of my own maleness to be able to grow right. and to become a man. So therefore, I begin to think I'm not like the other boys. I hide away from the other boys. And of course, what happens, I begin to see man-on-man -man relationships through a sexual lens, because that's the right. most profound experience that I'm having at the age of 8, 9, 10, 11, etc. So what's right. happening is I'm literally being formed to be able to identify the deep pleasure, the deep pleasures of life, etc. at the totally wrong age, in the totally wrong setting. And that yeah. begins to form me. Now, there's all of that, Tim, also on top of the fact that even when I was younger, I didn't feel like I belonged in the world of men. So it's never right. just one thing, never just right. one thing. And this is right. what's quite exciting for us is because even if you ban all the therapy for anybody around unwanted same-sex attraction, everybody with same-sex attraction, like everybody yeah. with other sex attraction, has got several issues in the brokenness of their life they need to deal with. So all we do is we just deal with lots of different issues to a brokenness. 
We don't even yeah. have to talk about same-sex attraction. But what's yeah. interesting so, about these yeah. laws, so, it's very, very yeah. clear that the LGBT community has realized what it takes to make somebody turn out homosexual. And they right. want to stop the possibility of that being undone. Right, yeah. So this is like a must stay gay law. You must stay gay or you must stay LGB, whatever it is. Um, That's right. Listen... It, 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 I mean, there's that whole phrase, pray away the gay. Well, and, and they laugh at that. But actually what they're doing is they're praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G. They're almost praying yeah. upon people until they're gay. And I meet many, many people who've been preyed upon during their childhood and their teenage years. And they sit and weep with me and they say, they make me gay. I'm like, yeah, deep down, that's exactly what happened, mate. That's what happened. That's right. your reality. Now we right. can start dealing with it. Right. And so, and just to delve into these laws a bit more, a question from Eva Marie on Facebook says, it's, it's a complicated question, so I'm going to summarise it. Like, does this apply to all attractions, like compulsive sexual disorders, whatever, paedophilia and stuff? You know, you're not able to get help for any any kind of sexual attraction, or is there a distinguishing, like, you know, you can help somebody for this, but not for that, or what? This is what's very difficult, is the laws are not accurate and clear. And therefore, if you have a gay judge or you have um, the chief minister who happens to be gay, who's putting pressure onto the judges and saying, We've, I've, I've read about this legal case, we need you to move in a certain direction. You know, we realize that actually the law is not black and white. Right. What happens, it starts to be able to be interpreted as people see fit. Now, this is very, very worrying because as we've already recognized, it, this will this will lead to a rise in paedophilic behavior happening that, 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 that people can't capture and stop. And so therefore, is this going to open up um, a whole new avenue for what people are calling maps, minor attracted people? You've got other sex attracted people, same sex attracted people, and now there's the whole thing about paedophiles right. or minor attracted people. If we're not careful, this could right. open the doorway for that. Okay, right. So, so listen. I need to. We need to sort of come to the end of this now. But I just want to allow Karis and then Andrea to comment on where we are in the UK in relation to this and what the churches can be doing about it. Karis, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, what James has said is very illuminating. I've heard much of what you said. You know, what you said in the past, but now in the context of Australia, it's really very alarming. Um, I don't know if you know, but a few days ago, the UN independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity said on his Facebook page that the UK is going to bring in a bill. Now, that's not been said by our government, but he's, we know he's in contact with our, with our government. Um, I know that from a meeting I attended with him a few months ago that you know, we had a human rights ambassador was asking for tips and so on. So we've got to watch out. I think two basic things to pick up on the experiences of people James has been talking about. Um, we just had the worst ever serial male rapist uh, imprisoned earlier this year in Britain and um, he was actually from another country from Indonesia he had targeted men who were straight he also had gay victims but he had mostly targeted straight men to turn them gay um, horrendous and there was immediate blackouts about his, his trial um, I covered it at the time of course some people are furious that I'd written victims of rape adult male victims of rape often develop unwanted same-sex attraction they will have no help if there's a, they, already it's not an adequate situation. If there's a criminal right. ban, there'll be further problems for them. The other group of people that need mentioning, I mean, there's so many more than I can mention, is young women and girls who become addicted to pornography. And, um, but they're horrified at the same time because now what the mainstream is very sadistic with male violence towards women and what the porn sites are reputed to be doing according to research by the British Board of Film Classification is suggesting lesbian pornography to them instead. And so, I mean, I suspect this has been going on for 25 years anyway. Um, and I think it helps explain the rise of same-sex attraction in young women. They think it's normal because what they see in the heterosexual sphere is not normal. It's actually sadism. And many more people need to be monitoring that and speaking out about that. Parents are ignorant of it. It's just this underground thing. Um, and so, again, a conversion therapy ban and criminalization will trap many more of these women who, who didn't want to be with other women originally. That's right. So I think it's fantastic what you're doing, James, you know, in terms of speaking with different generations. We want to see much more of that, actually, uh, as well as lobbying. And it's interesting. I mean, you know, much of my work now, aside from working alongside uh, uh, victims of childhood sexual abuse and people coming out of the, uh, of the LGBT community, is, is, is growing support networks for women who are struggling with pornography. 
Yeah. And, and, and it is a massive growing issue. Yeah. And if, you know, if, it, if there's one area we need to really pay attention to, it's this one. Andrea needs to talk. Yes. Do you know, in many ways I don't because um, the joy of you, James, of your true identity, of your <laughs> For us, the lesson of what happens is look at look at you and your joy. I tell you, I love it. I, I, cannot, I can't believe I'm alive. So many of my friends took their lives, Andrea, in the gay wow. community. And, and it, was, it was only when I went to the court of law and, uh, and, and this paedophile was there in the, in the box and, and I worked with the police and I realised that over seven of my peers from school committed suicide because of childhood wow. sexual abuse. Wow. And this is my argument. I'm saying to politicians, this is why I will not be quiet. I'm saying there is blood on your hands. You turn wow. around and say, oh, people are committing suicide. I'm like, show me where they are. But I'll tell you where they really are committing suicide. People are living out of profound trauma in the gay community. And you're telling them it's all fine. It is not fine. And people are living out of profound trauma because of childhood sexual abuse. And it's not fine. And nobody's investing in these people's lives. Well, I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to keep doing that. And I want to, and I want this. I want this live stream to go far and wide. I want this testimony and this story to be presented. I want people to hear it. We have been trying at Christian Concern uh, to get a meeting with Liz Trust, uh, the minister who will be looking um, with, looking at matters with regard to this proposed um, banning um, of therapy. And we we have now written twice. Uh, we have uh, followed up um as well we are not getting anywhere with that we're being ignored um they say that they're consulting but they're clearly not consulting no, but we will ensure that they we will ensure that they hear your test you we will ensure that they hear your testimony and i hope that those that are on this live stream today those that are joining us and and that they will that they will push this link out far and wide and that we will hear this incredible story of joy, not devastation, of life, not death. Yeah. Um, and thank you for showing us what it looks like, exactly what it looks like, and why we won't be silent. And no matter what the law, and even if the laws come against us, we won't be silent, and we will continue to offer the therapy and the counselling, and we will do it in any way that we um, can because we will keep on standing. We will stand alongside you and with you, and we will reach out to the little children mm. and then the teenagers and those adults that are so traumatized as you were, and yes. we will say this life transformative change. And I also want to say that um, when we think we're serving our children well by introducing them to sexualized concepts, and James talks about the fact that you, if you are aroused, if you are violated before your wedding night, um, then that opens up in you all kinds of avenues for trauma. Yes. You know, imagine teaching our children about the abundance of goodness of true identity. Imagine teaching our children what it would be to be pure until marriage. Imagine what it is to say that. That to be who you are, to be is 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 in a God given identity, and that life is valuable in and of itself. That your worth is not about the way you look, about your about sexuality generally, about sex. We are obsessed with the the God of sex, the God of our age, when in fact we should be obsessed with the joy of life, true joy, true life, and that's and what we do. And I just say this is, you know, and this is what I'm, I'm, I'm watching people who are leaving the gay community. They are becoming the new prophetic voices in yeah. our society. And our churches need to be open to welcoming people in who are choosing chastity, you know, who are saying, I may never get married, but I'm going to serve the Lord with all my yeah. heart, with all my, with all my yeah. might. You know, that, they have, this is why this is why being same sex attracted is not in and of itself a tragedy. Ultimately, in the Lord's eyes, the Lord turns all things to good for those who love him in accordance with his will. So whether somebody remains same sex attracted or not, you know, God brings good out of this situation. That's we it. just don't have the opportunity to do so. And I think that things like the changed movement, things like true love is that's coming out of Singapore, 
There's another website, uh, twoprisons.com. There's something called Free to Change. We're seeing stories galore across the globe of people mirroring my life. It's not just me. There's thousands of us out there now. Yeah. It's great. Amen. It is. Fantastic, James. We love it. We love you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank we you. really appreciate Thank it. You. Taking your evening over there in Australia. We'll hope to share and spread this uh, message all over the place. Uh, really powerful. Very, very inspiring story. Um, bless you. Thank you for coming on. And thank you to thank all you. of you for thank joining you. us on Roundtable with Christian Concern live. Um, we'll see you again next week. I hope you share and comment on this story as well. Thank you very much to all of you.